I'm going to give our second service talk. Uh, it's in, the theme of his talk is entitled Stay at Jehovah's Table. But let's talk a little bit about staying at Jehovah's Table. Now the fact that Jehovah has a table, it implies that Jehovah is a great host. Uh, there's no other table that a person would want to be at than to be at Jehovah's Table. You know, when you invite someone over to your home for a meal, there's a lot of preparation involved. There's forethought. And after all, we just don't let anyone into our home. It implies a relationship, a willingness on their part to have us to be with them. So the fact that Jehovah has a table uh, tells us that he's a great host, a very loving host, and he's reaching out to mankind. And turn with me in your Bible to the 23rd Psalm, and you'll see why we make this statement. Here in the 23rd Psalm, the psalmist is referring to Jehovah God. And look at what he says about our Heavenly Father, Jehovah. The Psalm 23 and verse 5. He said, You arrange before me a table in front of those showing hostility to me. With oil you have greased my head and my cup is well filled. So do you see what the psalmist is telling us about Jehovah? The psalmist tells us that Jehovah has already made arrangements. He's arranged before him a table in front of those showing hostility. That means here in the last days, in these terrible and wicked times in which we live, Jehovah has still made arrangements for us. Why well, our Heavenly Father has arranged a table. And look at what the psalmist tells us in verse 5. He said, with oil you've greased my head. Now, in Bible times, oil was not only a curative, but it denoted a time of joy, a time of peace. And usually, if you were traveling to someone's home to eat a meal, the only form of travel that you had was usually on foot. Now, unless you were extremely wealthy, you might have a chariot or individuals would carry you on their shoulders. But for the most part, everyone walked. Or, if you were fortunate enough to have a beast of burden that you could ride. But the average person, they just walked. So by the time you got to someone's home, you were dusty and scarred and ashy. You were pretty bad off. So what the host would do before they would serve you a meal with oil, they'd grease your head. They'd give you a rub down. Now imagine being invited to someone's home, and before you even eat a meal, they give you a massage. Just before you even eat a meal, they're going to rub you down and they just give you a massage. Wouldn't that be nice? You just sit there and say, okay, when well, I get this side here too, brother, you know, <laughs> let's rub you down. Because you smell the food. You know you're getting ready to eat. But for right now, with oil, the psalmist said, you've greased my head. And the psalmist said, now at your table, my cup is well filled. So the psalmist is telling us, I have everything I need at your table. It could be said, there's no need me going and rummaging around in the camps of the wicked one, trying to find sustenance and covering. I have everything I need right here at your table. What a table to be at. And the psalmist says of Jehovah, you've made arrangements for me to be at this table. And all that I need is right here. You rub me down with oil. You've greased my head. But look at the next verse in the 23rd Psalm in verse 6. Look at what the psalmist tells us about being at Jehovah's table. He said, Surely goodness and loving kindness themselves will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Jehovah to the length of days. So the psalmist says, Now as long as I'm at Jehovah's table, look at what pursues me. He said, Surely, if I can just stay at this table. He said, Look at what pursues me. Verse 6 said, Loving kindness themselves will pursue me. Goodness will pursue us if we can just stay at Jehovah's table. And the psalmist said there, he said, I'll dwell at Jehovah's house to the length of days. He said, once I get at that table, I'll never leave. He said, you couldn't blow me away from that table. But if I could just get at Jehovah's table, he said, I have everything I need. And look at what's pursuing us when we're at Jehovah's table. Have you ever been pursued by something? Now, not someone, but something. You ever been pursued by something? How would you feel if you were being pursued by a pit bull terrier? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, due to the, the, the ferocious nature of that dog and its terrible reputation that it has, that dog is banned in some countries. You can't even bring it into the country. What would you do if you were being pursued by a pit bull? Or how about a snake? What would you do if you were being pursued by a snake? 
Now, the way the snakes are made, uh, they're attracted to warm-blooded animals. That's you and I. A snake can detect heat the way our hearing can detect sound. When you hear a sound and we automatically can turn, we know where it's coming from. Well, that's the way a snake can detect heat. It can detect a warm-blooded animal and it'll automatically start pursuing you. It'll automatically come towards you. But that's not what pursues us when we're at Jehovah's table. The psalmist said, goodness and loving kindness will pursue us all the days if we can just stay at Jehovah's table. Regardless of what happens in this time of a hostile world, goodness is going to pursue you. Loving kindness will pursue you if we can just stay at Jehovah's table. Now it reminds me of a time of a story that uh, one of the district overseers told and I understand he might have served some of you here in this area and uh, at the time he was a circuit overseer and, uh, and our work was separated. Now the world was segregated but Jehovah's people they were just separated. So what happened is the black circuit overseer, he would serve the black congregations, and the white circuit overseer, he would serve the white congregations. Well, this brother was on his way to his new assignment. He was serving in the deep south. Now the state, the name of the state will be withheld to protect the innocent and the guilty. <laughs> but he said, Mac, we were serving in the deep south. He said, we already had three strikes against us. He said, now number one, we were Jehovah's Witnesses. That was a strike against us. He said, number two, we were black and we were in the deep south. He said, number three, so I'll tell you number three in a minute. But him and his wife, they're on their way to their new assignment. They have a guest with them too. The guest came and said, I'm going to ride to your new congregation with you. It's your first congregation in your new assignment. And while they're on their way, they notice they passed a little enclave in the road and out pulls a pickup truck and started following them. He said it was one of those pickup trucks where you could see the rifle in the window. <laughs> but this driving could be coincidental. They're just driving down the street. They have a map of the sister's home where they're supposed to go, where they're going to be staying. But every turn he made, the pickup truck made the same turn. He sped up a little bit and the pickup truck sped up. So right about now, he's noticing this and his wife and the friend along with him, they began to notice it too. He said, well, don't worry about it because we have a map and uh, according to this map, I can just make a right turn and get off this main drag. I can go down and it looks like I can make a left a couple miles down. I'll make another left. We'll be right back on our main street. So that's not a problem. You know, every turn he made, the pickup truck made the same turn. He went up over the ravine and the pickup truck went up over the ravine right behind him. He sped up and the pickup truck sped up too. So right about now, he's on the main drag, and he said his heart's beating, but he's not letting his wife know. He says, you know, I'm just going to pull over and just see what this is all about. He told his wife. He's explaining to his wife and his sister with him. He says, now you all stay in the car. He said, I'm going to go back here. He says, now don't leave me. <laughs> but I'm just going to go back here and just see what this is all about. Because as he slowed down, the pickup truck slowed down. He pulled over, the pickup truck pulled over too. Right about the time he finishes explaining to his wife what they should do and stay in the car and be safe, here comes a knock on the window. He said, Mac, it was a hard knock too. It was one of those, roll the window down. That's what the man said. Big burly white man. He said, roll the window down. He said, now by now the brothers, he said he's got no moisture in his mouth. He just, <laughs> his heart is beating. He's got his wife and his other sister right here. This is, this is attack to his manhood now. He said, now, Mac, remember now, we already had three strikes against us. He said, number, number one, we were Jehovah's Witnesses in the Deep South. He said, number two, we were black. He said, and number three, we were driving a Volkswagen. You ever try to outrun somebody in a Volkswagen? <laughs> he said, so we couldn't outrun him, even though he was in the pickup truck. So he just kind of paused there. He's, he's probably saying a prayer to Jehovah, and all of a sudden, the man knocks on the window again. Roll the window down. So he says, he kind of cracked the window a little bit, and with the deepest voice he could muster, he said, yes, can we help you? <laughs> he said, the man said, are you Jehovah's Witnesses? Now, that was already one of the strikes against him. <laughs> They're black. The man could see that. And he knew they could not run him in his Volkswagen. So the brother said, he just kind of answered and said, uh, he didn't know where this was going to go. He just said, yes, we are. 
He said, the man said, I thought so. My mother's one of you people. She's a Jehovah's Witness. She told me the black traveling overseer was coming in town. I got all kind of food and blankets, all kind of non-perishables back here in the truck to give to you. You made quite a few turns there, didn't you, buddy? <laughs> you know what the brother said? He said, Mac, we learned we couldn't run from a blessing. <laughs> he said, here, loving kindness and goodness is pursuing us, and we're trying to run from a blessing. He said, if we can just stay at Jehovah's table, goodness and loving kindness will pursue us all the days of our life if we can stay at Jehovah's table. But guess what happened? Something happened you'll never believe. With all of this goodness, all of this kindness, all of this love on Jehovah's part, guess what happened? Would you believe that the nation of Israel left Jehovah's table? Can you believe that? Would you believe that they as a nation left this wonderful table that Jehovah had arranged for them? Now it was so shocking, it was so unbelievable that Jehovah told the heavens, he told the angels, he said, you won't believe it. You won't believe what my people have done. Turn with me in the book of Jeremiah chapter 2. And these are the words of Almighty God, Jehovah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, Let's read together, starting there at verse 12 of Jeremiah 2. In Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 12, now here's what the Bible says. Stare in amazement, O you heavens, at this, and bristle up in very great horror, is the utterance of Jehovah, because there are two bad things my people have done. They have left even me, the source of living water, in order to hew out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot contain the water. Could you believe that? Jehovah told the heavens, oh, you won't believe it. It's going to be scary. If you can just look at what my people have done. Jehovah said they left me the source of living water. And what did they leave him for? They didn't even leave him for a well. A well is a source of water. Jehovah said they left me for a cistern. Now, you know what a cistern is? We're not down south. Don't think I'm referring to the sisters as cisterns. <laughs> no, a cistern is a little cavity of rock. It's a little runoff of rainwater. It's a little cavity in a rock, and when it rains, the runoff just kind of runs down into this cistern. Or a person may make a cistern, and they may take water and dump it in the cistern, but now it's not a well. It's not a source of water. Through heat and evaporation, that water will drain. And Jehovah said, they left me not for a well, but for a cistern, and a broken cistern, one that didn't even work. Jehovah said, oh, you won't believe it. He said, stare in amazement, O heavens. You won't believe what you're seeing. That's what he had to tell the angels. The nation of Israel left Jehovah. They put their trust and confidence in other nations. They left Jehovah's table. Now, it's so shocking. It's one of the members of the governing body told us when we first went to Bethel. He told us of a brother at Bethel that didn't want to get his hair cut. Now, at Bethel, we get our hair cut every three weeks. That's law. You got to get your hair cut every three weeks. You're going to go somewhere. Either you're going to cut it, your wife's going to cut it, or the Bethel barber's going to cut it. But you're going to get your hair cut every three weeks. You know, there was a brother at Bethel, he refused to get his hair cut. He didn't want to get his hair cut. The brothers had to talk with him and counsel him and encourage him, encourage him to cut his hair. You know, he refused to cut his hair. Well, they, they work with him. They showed patience. Finally, they let him know, you know, your qualifications to stay at Bethel are in question if you don't want to cut your hair. Would you believe he left Bethel? Stared amazement, oh heavens, and bristle up in horror. He left Bethel because he didn't want to cut his hair. Well, he left Bethel and he went home. There's not a knock against Florida, but he went back home. He went to Florida. That's where he was from. He went back home and tried to get a job. Try to get hired at Disney World. And so the proprietor there that was interviewing him says, you know, you look good and um, we want to hire you. At that time, Disney World, they ran a tight ship. They says, only problem is uh, you're going to have to get your hair cut. <laughs> Would you believe he cut his hair? <laughs> Stare at amazement, oh heavens. <laughs> and bristled up in great heart. You won't believe it. <laughs> you know, he cut his hair 
to work at Disney World. Now, I remember the governing body, Brother Barber, he's telling us this. He said he cut his hair. He wouldn't cut his hair for the Messianic Kingdom, but he cut it for the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> Brother Barber told us he said he wouldn't cut his hair for Christ Brothers, but he cut it for Mickey Mouse and not Christ Brothers. He said, bristle up in great horror. You won't believe what you're seeing. Here's a man at Bethel, and he left Jehovah's table there at Bethel because he didn't want to cut his hair. You know, at Bethel, the brothers want us to put implicit trust and confidence in Jehovah. In spite of the trials that we have, never waver in your confidence in Jehovah. Look at what Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 18 has to say. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 2, look at verse 18 and what it tells us. And now, this is Jehovah speaking, what concern should you have for the way of Egypt in order to drink the waters of Shihar? And what concern should you have for the way of Assyria in order to drink the waters of the river? Well, Jehovah was asking his people, the nation of Israel, in spite of your trials, why are you turning to these nations when you have everything you need right here? Why would you turn to Egypt? In Bible drama, Egypt pictures the world. Why would we turn to the world when we have everything we need right here at Jehovah's table? Assyria pictured the military might the political might. Job was saying, why would you turn to other sources to find sustenance and covering? Why would you go rummaging and around in the camp of the wicked one when you have everything you need right here at my table? He says, what concern should you have for the way of the river? So we're being told and encouraged today to stay at Jehovah's table. You know, brothers and sisters, if you only knew if you only knew the love and concern that the governing body and other anointed brothers had for you, you, you'd never leave that table. You see, at Bethel, we hear their prayers. Believe me, they're praying long and they're praying hard about you. They know you're out here in the trenches. You're on the front line. They know what you're going through. It's not just a group of men in a building producing literature. It's not that way. We hear their prayers. We hear their love and their concern. If you only knew. You know that the members of the governing body, they feel directly responsible for each member of the great crowd. If anything happens to you, they feel that they've been disobedient to Christ. They feel there's something that they didn't do right. Maybe they could have done more. Can the Watchtower study articles, can they get any plainer? You see, if you only knew and could understand how the brothers feel. Don't think it's just men in a brick building and they can't identify with what you're going through. Oh, they can. And they want us to appreciate Jehovah's loving kindness. They want us to stay at Jehovah's table. They want us to work with the fresh waters of truth that come from Jehovah. So they're concerned about you. They're doing all that they can to help you to stay at Jehovah's table. Now, from time to time, we have Bible discussions by members of the governing body and other brothers right there at Bethel. And those brothers, they can open up the Bible. They can help us to see Jehovah's love. And you know what pursues us all the days at Jehovah's table? Goodness and loving kindness. Uh, they help us to appreciate Jehovah's loving kindness. Well, one night we had a talk by a member of the governing body. Brother Siddick is his name. Now, believe me, Brother Siddick, he just finished his earthly course. Bethel will never be the same for many of us. Never be the same. We learn things from that man accidentally. Just accidentally we learn things from him. The things he tried to tell us on purpose, we couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle what he was trying to tell us. He's told us things, and myself personally, it took me eight years to understand what he was talking about. It took me eight years. It might only have taken you three. I'm not the smartest man in the world. <laughs> you know, one day I was going on a shepherding call, and I was relatively a new elder, and I did all my research and homework. And uh, as they say, I had a packet of research. It was about, about that thick. 
and it was hot every time I read it. Every time I read it, I was like, oh yeah, we're going to work with this brother. <laughs> and so it was Friday, and Friday morning, Brother Siddick, he's always down early reading before morning worship starts. I saw Brother Siddick over there, and I said, well, he's going to like this. So I said, Brother Siddick, we're going to go make a shepherding call. He said, that's good, Mac. That's good. The brothers need shepherding. <laughs> I said, see, I knew I was in line. <laughs> So I walked over. I said, Brother Siddick, this is, I explained the situation. I said, Brother Siddick, this is what we're going to share with the brother. I kind of handed him a packet, kind of proud like this. And I was kind of handed it to him like, yeah, this. I knew he couldn't possibly have anything to add to what I did because I did all the research in the Slay's publication. So I just said, hey, Brother Siddick, this is what we're going to share with him. And he took what I had and he started reading it. I was standing up over him, about right next to him. He, he read a little bit. He looked up at me, and he, he read a little bit more. He looked up at me. And all of a sudden, he said, Mac, you don't get it, do you? I was offended. I said, what is this brother talking about? I don't get it. I did all the research and the publications he probably wrote. He's talking about I don't get it. He said, now, Mac, according to what you explained to me, you're going to share this with him? So now, by now, I'm kind of back. I'm saying, well, I kind of thought we, were gonna, I thought we were going to share it with him. He said, Mac, you don't get it. He said, the brothers don't need this. He said, they don't need this. He said, now, based on what you explained to me, you're going to share this with the brother. He said, Mac, just the way women show up to work nowadays is sexual harassment. They don't have to say anything to the brother. Just the way they show up to work nowadays is sexual harassment. And you're going to try to share this with him? He said, the brothers don't need this. He said, the brothers need to know that you care. They need to know that you feel. He looked at me and said, they don't need this. He said, Mac, the brothers, they don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. I left there with my head hanging down. <laughs> now, as I was leaving the dining room, because I was taking what I had and I put it in the garbage. <laughs> I did. I threw it away. But as I was leaving, leaving the dining room, Brother Sillick called to me. He said, Mac, you're barely in the truth. He told me I was barely in the truth. <laughs> but I caught on. It took eight years, but I caught on. I began to realize what he meant. It was years later, Brother Sillick, he gave a talk to the Bethel family. Now, anyone who was at Bethel at that time, we all remember that talk. It was landmark. It was a landmark talk. Now, we were so quiet as a family, you could hear a pin drop, and we were sitting on carpet. Now, here's the way he started his talk. He said, I'm going to tell you now, we're going to talk about something you know very little about, if you will ever understand it. That's where he started his talk. He said, we're going to talk about something you know very little about, if you will ever understand it. He said, we're going to talk about Jehovah's loving kindness. That was his introduction. He said, there's a new king in Israel. David is the new king. Now, whenever there was a new king, it would be great times for the family of the new king, but horrible times for the family of the old king. Because, you see, usually all the boys would be killed for fear they'd come back for revenge for their father. He said, there's a new king in Israel. And David did something that was shocking. No other king ever did this before. What he did was unprecedented. No other king did this. And he's telling us, we're going to talk about Jehovah's loving kindness. If you will ever understand it. And then he told us to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's turn there. Here in the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 9. He's telling us that King David really pictures Jehovah. And look at verse 9. And David proceeded to say, Is there yet anyone that is left over of the house of Saul 
that I may exercise loving kindness toward him for the sake of Jonathan? No one ever did this. Saul was the old king, treated David in a terrible way. But now notice what David said. He said, is there anybody else left over in that household? Why? For what reason? He said that I can exercise toward him loving kindness. Now look at verse 2. Now the house of Saul had a servant whose name was Ziba. That's significant. The house of Saul had a servant whose name was Ziba. So they called him to David and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? To which he said, I am your servant. Now what Ziba is saying, he said, I'm your man. In the common vernacular today, he said, I'm your man. Now what Ziba is telling him is, I served in the household of Saul. I know what takes place in these households of royalty. I know what belongs here, and I'm your man. I can serve in your house too. Now look at what David said to Ziba. Verse 3. And the king went on to say, Is there nobody of the house of Saul anymore that I may exercise toward him the loving kindness of God? You see, it's Jehovah's loving kindness. David said, I'm looking for people to show loving kindness to. Now Ziba's response. At this, Ziba said to the king, there is yet a son of Jonathan lame in the feet. Now did you hear what Ziba said? Do you understand what Ziba is saying? He said, now king, now don't go too far. Now hold on, king. He said, I'm your man and I know what goes on in these households of royalty. I know what belongs here. And the only person that left in that household, he's a cripple. He's lame in his feet. He doesn't belong in these households of royalty. Don't go too far, king. Just slow down. I know how to serve in this house. But, look at verse 4. Then the king said to him, where is he? So Ziba said to the king, look. He is in the house of Maacher, the son of Amuel, of Lodabar. Brother Silic said, Lodabar! Lodabar. He said it was the ghetto. It was across the tracks. It was a land of thorns and thistles. It was a barren wasteland. No one lived there but undesirables. No one lived in Lodabar but cripples, the lowly, the so-called lowlife. And Ziba said now, He's a cripple. He's over there in Lodabar. He doesn't belong here. Now Mephibosheth, uh, when the news came about his father and grandfather being killed, the nurse that was carrying him, he's about five years old, the nurse that was carrying him in a rush because of this terrible news, she dropped him. And from that time on, he was lame in both of his feet. Now being somewhat of an adult, he's living over there in Lodabar somewhere. And Brother Siddick told us that David said, that's the man I'm looking for. That's the person I'm looking for. He said, you go over there and you get him. And you bring him here. Because I'm looking for people like that to show loving kindness to. Now, so that for those of us that were still alive at this time, what he did next, then we fell out. <laughs> He picked up a bell and he said, picture this. He said, dinner time in David's house. He said, who would you expect to be at dinner at the king's house? Who eats dinner at the king's table? Who would you expect to be there? Now remember, David had a beautiful family. Beauty ran strong in the family. They were beautiful people. It didn't do him much good, but beauty ran in the family. <laughs> the Bible said David was a ruddy man. You know what that means? That means you couldn't even tell his complexion. He was so beautiful, you couldn't place his complexion. Just a ruddy, handsome young man. Remember David's son, Absalom? Absalom would be right there at the table. Anybody remember Absalom? Okay, sister said, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, You know, they cut Absalom's hair once a year. His hair alone weighed five pounds. Yes, that's true. His hair alone weighed five pounds. Handsome Absalom, David's son, he'd be right there at that table because it's dinner time in the king's house. 
and these beautiful people would be there. Now look at what the Bible says about Absalom. Just hold your spot there in 2 Samuel chapter 9, but turn over to chapter 14. That's if you could. 2 Samuel chapter 14. Look at verse 25. Look at what the Bible says about Absalom. Now, compared with Absalom, there proved to be no man so beautiful in all Israel as to be praised so much. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there proved to be no defect in him. What a man. So there's Absalom. Now the sisters, they're looking for Absalom right now. There's Absalom. Beautiful Absalom. He's sitting there at the king's table. Well, who else would you expect to be at the king's table? Brother Siddick helped us to appreciate. Who else would you expect to be there? You remember Absalom's sister, Tamar? Beautiful Tamar. Brother Siddick said, Tamar, beautiful Tamar. <laughs> he described Tamar. He said she had beauty treatments that were peculiar to kings. Only she would have it because she's the king's daughter. Oh, he just painted a picture of Absalom. He said she probably smelled like the flowers of Lebanon. She had been bathed with the oils of Goshen and Bashan. And there's beautiful Absalom. Now remember, she was so beautiful, her half-brother raped her. Remember, she was so gorgeous, her half-brother said, well, I gotta have her. That's how beautiful she was. Her half-brother raped her. So there's, there's beautiful Tamar. She's sitting right there at the table. He described Tamar so beautiful that we were looking for Tamar that night. <laughs> oh, we love our wives. But we just wanted to see Tamar that night. Well, who else would be at that table? Brother Siddick said, there at the end of the table, there's probably Solomon with his head buried in a book. He's just reading, laying the foundation for Jehovah to use all of this later on as he inspires him with wisdom. There's Solomon down there, studious at the table with his head in a book. Who else would you expect to be at the table? Because it's dinner time at the king's house. Well, his nephews would be there. Remember Abishai and Joab, mighty warriors? Abishai is one of only, he was only one of the only three men that ever killed a lion, a mighty man. There's courageous Abishai, he's right there at the table. And now he starts strutting to and from the platform, Brother Siddiq. He said, in walks David's nephew, Joab. Brother Siddick said he was sun-baked, skin looked like tanned leather, had beady eyes of a killer, and Brother Siddick said he was cut. <laughs> Sisters know what cut is. <laughs> he said, in walks Joab. And David just signals to him and Joab, his nephew, he, he takes his seat at the table. With all of this beauty at the table, and all of a sudden you hear sklark clink, sklark clink, sklark clink. In walks a cripple. With all of this beauty at the table, in walks a cripple from Lodabar named Mephibosheth. Now, Brother Siddick said, the rest of the kids probably said, Dad, now can he get his food to go, please? <laughs> And then that's when he lowered the boom on us. He said, we're all crippled brothers. Adam and Eve dropped every one of us. So we're all crippled. And the problem is we make it hard for each other to stay at the table. It's no wonder some don't want to stay at the table by the way we treat them. We look up at them and say, now she need to quit. Where's she going? <laughs> we look at the brother and say, now nah, I knew he wasn't going to make it. He said, we're all crippled brothers. Adam and Eve dropped every one of us. And oh, you live in the ghetto. Now, no matter what you pay for your mortgage, you can be over in Gahanna if you want to. <laughs> oh no, you live in the ghetto. See. We live in the last days of a wicked and a dying system. Don't, don't let them fool you. You're in the ghetto. This world is terrible outside. The only way we can make it out is if we stay at Jehovah's table and we make it hard on each other to stay at the table. Every last one of us, we got problems. We're all messed up. Every one of us, we're all messed up. Walking through the house, riding down the street, talking to ourselves. We're all messed up. 
We got frailties and foibles we don't want anyone to know. We can't even understand why Jehovah would have us at his table. You know, that's the way Mephibosheth was. He couldn't understand it. He couldn't understand Jehovah's loving kindness. He wanted to know, what do you see in me? With all of this beauty at this table, I don't belong at this table. Isn't that the way you feel sometimes? There's things about you you don't want anyone else to know. You compromised. You capitulated. You went back. You didn't do what was right. You've got problems that you know about. There's some terrible things that you hope, well, only I know. I know Jehovah knows, but only I know. And we don't feel worthy to be at the table. You know, when Mephibosheth was at the table, how many times you think he looked up and he saw Absalom and said, oh, what a handsome man. Here I am a cripple. What a man. He said, I don't belong at the table. David, can I be excused, please? And David said, stay at the table. What do you think, how do you think Mephibosheth felt when he looked up and saw Tamar? Beautiful woman. He said, oh, Lord, look at that woman. I don't, I don't even belong at the table with her. Excuse me, David, uh, can I be excused, please? And David said, stay at the table. You think he can match wits with Solomon? He knew he couldn't match wits with Solomon. He looked down and see that man reading a book and said, no, let me, David, let me, can I <laughs> stay at the table? Oh, if he looked at Abishai and Joab, mighty warriors. Here he is, a cripple, lame in both feet, and mighty warriors sitting at the table. He felt one of their looks would kill him. He probably didn't want to look at him. Hey, David, David, you got your boys over there. Can I, can, can, can I leave the table? And David says, stay at the table. You know, when we compare ourselves with our brothers and sisters, we feel that we're not worthy to be at the table. We look at what some of the others are doing and we said, I, I shouldn't be, I don't belong here at this table. And Jehovah's telling us, stay at the table. We don't feel worthy at times. We're struggling, aren't we? You know, the slave has told us a struggling person is not a bad, you're just struggling, that's all. A struggling person is not a bad person. Remember, Jehovah loves us, not for what we are, but for what we want to be. For what we're trying to be. We're not there yet. And you know what? On your strength, you may never get there. Not on this end. You may never get there. But Jehovah's saying, stay at the table. Don't leave. Appreciate my loving kindness. Jehovah's not like man. He's not limited like man. You see, man has long memories. We don't forget that's not the God we serve. We see a sister, she's doing fine now. A person says, yeah, but I knew her back at 84. <laughs> person says something about a brother. You know that brother, he's a fine brother. They say, well, he's all right. I remember when he used to be an LC. Now, why did you have to bring that up? You don't feel he's worthy to be at the table. We make it hard on each other by the way we treat each other to stay at that table. And so we question ourselves. Mephibosheth, he was the same way. He felt, I, I don't belong here. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. Let's turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Look at verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 7. And David went on to say to him, that is Mephibosheth, do not be afraid. For without fail, I shall exercise loving kindness toward you for the sake of Jonathan, your father. And I must return to you all the field of Saul, your grandfather. And you yourself will eat bread at my table constantly. You see what David, now he couldn't understand it. Mephibosheth could not understand that David is saying, don't worry, don't be afraid. I'm going to give you all that you have coming to you. He couldn't understand Jehovah's loving kindness. And at times, we feel the same way. We, we don't feel worthy. Now, one of the worst things that you could be in Israel is a dog. Now, in Israel, a dog was a dog. They don't treat dogs the way we treat them here in this Western world. 
Here in this Western world, dogs have houses and sweaters. And they get operations and facelifts and things of that nature. Oh no, that's what, that's the way they treat dogs nowadays. In Israel, a dog was a dog. It was one of the worst things that you could be. And the, the, the most disgraceful death you could have is to die and have the dogs come and lick you up. Mephibosheth couldn't understand Jehovah's loving kindness. The, way, the same way we are. Look at what he said. 2 Samuel chapter 9, look at verse 8. After David said, don't worry, don't be afraid. At that he prostrated himself and says, what is your servant that you have turned your face to the dead dog? Such as I am. He couldn't believe it. Do you know some of our brothers and sisters, they pray that they can just die. Some just pray to Jehovah, Jehovah, just, just let me die. Just let me die and bring me back in the resurrection. You won't even let me die even. That's what the way some of the friends feel. They can't understand Jehovah's loving kindness. And Jehovah's telling us that he's not limited like man. Jehovah's saying, why are you ending a sentence with a question mark when I've ended it with a period? He's saying, stay at the table. There's no question about you. Just stay at the table. Remember Manasseh. He did on a grand scale what was bad in Jehovah's eyes. The Bible said he did on a large scale what was bad in Jehovah's eyes. Jehovah not only forgave him, but he restored him to the kingship. Now that's the God we serve. He made him king again. That's forgiveness on Jehovah's part. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of the way you feel, don't leave. Just stay at Jehovah's table. Sure, you're going through trials and you've had hard times. There's things about you you don't want anyone to know. And when people come in you, then you feel worse. You say, well, if you really knew how I was, you wouldn't say that. Now I feel even worse. But Jehovah's telling us, I'm looking for people like you to show loving kindness to. He said, just stay at the table. That's what the members of the governing body are telling us. Brothers and sisters, just, just stay at the table. Don't leave. Don't view yourself the way others view you. Look at yourself based on the loving kindness. If we only knew the power of God, that's what's wrong with some of us. We can't forgive ourselves. We can't let it go. But we're dealing with the power of God and his loving kindness. Now, if that weren't enough, what Brother Siddick explained next, for those that were still alive, they fell out then. <laughs> he helped us to appreciate that uh, at the king's table, dinner time at the king's house, they didn't sit upright the way we're sitting now in this Western world, upright in chairs. He said usually the, the tables were a little bit lower and they would kind of recline on the hip and the elbow. They would recline at the table. And these tables and these households of royalty, they had these beautiful embroidered long skirts that covered the entire table. They were beautiful tablecloths that covered the entire table. And these tablecloths were so long that they covered everyone's legs. So when Mephibosheth was at the table, once he came to the table, he was like everyone else. All of his frailties, his foibles, they were all covered. And Brother Silic told us that skirt, it represented the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So Jehovah's telling us, you're covered at this table. I got you covered at this table. Just stay at the table. Don't leave, regardless of your circumstances and how you feel, regardless of what you've gone through in life. Trouble is our lot, so we're going to have trouble. Regardless of your past, whatever has happened to you, don't leave the table. Regardless of your trials, the brothers are praying long and hard. They want us to stay at Jehovah's table. Look at verse 13, 2 Samuel chapter 9. 
and verse 13. It kind of sums it up for us. And Mephibosheth himself was dwelling in Jerusalem. He's no longer in Lodabar. For it was constantly at the table of the king that he was eating. And he was lame in both of his feet. He stayed at that table. Regardless of how he felt, he stayed at that table. He stayed in Jerusalem, which represents pure worship. And so Jehovah has invited all of us. Although we're lame and crippled because Adam and Eve dropped us. Although though we have trials and we don't feel that we deserve it. We don't feel we're worthy. Jehovah is telling us to stay at his table. Brothers and sisters, it's dinner time. It's dinner time in the king's house. Whatever you do, stay at the table. Don't leave. And always appreciate Jehovah's loving kindness.